Good afternoon. I am Chip Zukoski. I'm the provost here at UB. And I'm pleased to welcome you to the opening event of the third annual Critical Conversations program on behalf of UB President Satish Tripathi, who was unable to join us this afternoon. Two years ago, President Tripathi launched the Critical Conversations programs as an opportunity to inspire meaningful dialogue on campus, among our faculty, students, and staff, and across the entire community. As an academic community at the forefront of innovation, our faculty, our scholars, our students are driven by curiosity, by the desire to uncover answers to pressing questions of our time. This year's program continues the tradition of inviting to campus prominent scholars leading the conversation on broad-ranging issues that matter deeply, not only leading the conversation within our university community, but also in our entire society. One of the hallmarks of the Critical Conversations program is its interdisciplinary focus, which is also the foundation of UB's new communities of excellence, our integrated approach to addressing critical societal challenges through impactful interdisciplinary research, education, and engagement. The subject of today's conversation, decreasing global maternal and child mortality, dovetails with the work of our community of excellence on global health equity, and thus contributes to the ongoing conversations and concern on the campus. We are delighted to welcome our featured guest, Dr. John Barrazzo, Chief, Maternal, Chief of Maternal and Child Health Division in the Bureau of Global Health at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Dr. Barrazzo's job at USAID is truly global in nature. He spends much of his time traveling around the world working to alleviate poverty and improve health outcomes in the vulnerable populations USAID serves. I understand that he has just returned from Africa and that he has foregone a trip to Mexico to be with us here this week. So we're cooling him down before he goes south to warm up again. Um, I want to personally thank him for his willingness to take time out of his busy schedule and be with us for this critical conversation that we're holding today. As a physicist and engineer by training, Dr. Barrazzo's interdisciplinary approach to solving problems throughout his career has led him um, to become a leading voice on global health policy, particularly in the area of child and maternal health. We very much look forward to Dr. Barrazzo's insights and perspectives on those important global health issues. I would also like to thank Dr. Pavani Ram, um, Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Environmental Health and Director of our Community of Excellence in Global Health Equity for moderating today's discussion and her efforts to bring Dr. Barrazzo to UB. Sincere thanks also to our panelists for participating in today's discussion. So they are Mr. Bazan Lin, a Program Coordinator of the Burmese Community Support Center and a UB alumnus. Um, Shanta, Dr. Shanta Musid Musad, um, Assistant Professor of Social Work. Dr. Sarah Robert, Assistant Professor of Learning and Instruction in the Graduate School of Education. Dr. Luke Scannell, a UB doctoral student in Civil Structural and Environmental Engineering. Um, and Dr. Corydon Smith, um, Associate Professor of Architecture uh, and Planning. Um, I'd like to extend a special welcome to members of the local community. Um, plus, Dr. Marge Wingler and her husband, Paul, who are over here. Um, <clears throat> who are here from California. Dr. Wingler is a member of the Dean's Advisory Council and a graduate of the College of Arts and Sciences, and her impressive career included an NIH fellowship and multiple scientific leadership roles at the biotechnology firm of Genetech. Dr. Winkler's success and um, the research of the other women panelists may be of particular interest to our very special guests, more than 30 students from the Honor STEM program at the Sacred Heart Academy. We are especially delighted to have you with us and hope to see many of you, as I've been saying, enrolled here at UB when you graduate. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you again, all, for being with us for today's panel discussion, which promises to be an intriguing and enlightening conversation. I encourage you also to join us at 2.30 tomorrow afternoon for Dr. Barrazzo's 
keynote address at the Student Union Theater on the North Campus when he will be talking about bringing the work of all disciplines and sectors together to, a preventable, to end preventable child and maternal deaths. Uh, you can find all the details on tomorrow's event at our UB website and on the Office of the President's homepage. I'm now very pleased to introduce um, Dr. Pavina Ram, who will moderate today's panel. Thank you, Provost Sikorsky, and thanks all of you for being here today. I'm really pleased um, to be able to welcome Dr. John Barrazzo, who I've known for a number of years now. Um, and John has just always been such a thoughtful uh, colleague, and, um, and I, I think that for our newly launched community for global health equity, this couldn't come at a better time for us to speak to a leading thinker in the, in the space of maternal and child health, which remains a, an exemplar of inequities around the world. The reasons why mothers die during childbirth or during pregnancy and the reasons why young children continue to die of preventable deaths are essentially attributable to inequity. And so I think our opportunity to learn from John is, is really, really critical at this key time as we launch our newly launched community for global health equity. So I just wanted to take a couple of minutes because there are some new uh, folks in the audience who haven't heard about this community of excellence. Um, so I'll just take a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about that and then we'll move on to our uh, panelists who will actually be taking up the bulk of the time. Um, what we'll do is um, after each of our panelists, we'll take one qu clarifying question and then Dr. Barraza will offer some reflections and then we'll open up for a broader Q&A or discussion. Um, and so we'll have microphones available um, for questions and also for discussion time, okay? Um, so our, this is one of the three newly launched communities of excellence, as Provost Zukoski has mentioned. Um, I wanted to uh, thank the Provost and the Vice Provost for, uh, the Vice President for Research and Academic Development and the Senior Vice Provost for Academic Affairs for all of their thoughtful efforts in developing this Communities of Excellence program. Um, also, sincere thanks to Connie Holloman, who's the Deputy to the President, who's done a tremendous job in um, organizing Dr. Barrazzo's visit. We really deeply appreciate it. So to launch onto the Community for Global Health Equity, I'm one of four co-leaders, um, Dr. Corden Smith, who's uh, here on the panel, as well as Dr. Lee Lin uh, from Industrial and Systems Engineering and uh, Dr. Samina Raja from Urban and Regional Planning. All of us have worked uh, quite hard, I think, uh, to get the community going. Um, so this community is all about addressing health inequity, the unjust differences that exist in health be between persons of different social groups. And we identify these inequities because of a number of uh, sets of systemic barriers, including gaps in science, um, some sociocultural barriers, um, the application of ineff ineffectual policies and or ineffective practices. Our interest here at the University of Buffalo, which is relatively new to the global health domain, is to say that there are a number of underutilized disciplines or domains that can address these challenging inequities that continue to exist around the world. And so we've identified these as what we call apex disciplines, architecture, planning, engineering, and a whole host of cross-synergizing disciplines. And I know some of our colleagues from these various disciplines are here today. So we want health science faculty and staff and students to work together with APEX faculty, staff, and students to address these challenging equity issues. We've identified a, a process by which we'd be working on uh, these uh, issues that I'm not going to show you today, but if you're interested, um, we're more than happy to chat. We have ongoing conversations every Wednesday morning, every other Wednesday morning at 8 a.m., um, and so please do reach out. Um, we're working already on a number of working groups and then some project teams that have gotten started, and we're anticipating developing several more. So these include, for example, air quality for neonatal health, inclusive design for sanitation for people with uh, varied abilities, the issues of drug stockouts, the lack of availability of pharmaceutical supplies to treat basic medical conditions in low-income contexts, and others are, are getting underway as well. So again, if you're interested, we'd love to hear from you. I'm sorry you can't see that, but it's really simple. We hope you'll remember it, globalhealth at buffalo.edu. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to present, um, to introduce Mr. Luke Scannell who, Scannell, who is a PhD student in civil structural and environmental engineering. Thank you again. Okay. 
Thank you for the introduction. Um, today, I'd like to talk about a certain challenge, that six, over 660 million people lack access to clean water. And most of these people live in rural and remote areas where standard engineering technologies aren't going to be effective. And by that, I mean the technology that we're you need to implement in these places need to be um, sustainable as a technology and economic and cultural. The people need to be able to make it there, use it, and it needs to provide something to them. And we like to call this an empowered, sustainable approach to water treatment. And there's a couple examples pictured here, using a salary to filter water or using solar disinfection. But what I want to talk about today is ceramic water filters. And that's what I mostly work with. You can imagine these very similarly to a clay pot. You have local clay, water, and you fire it just as you would with any pottery. So a lot of this stuff to make this is already in place. The difference is that we add an organic material, such as sawdust, rice husks, or anything locally found that can be broken down to the appropriate size. When these are fired, the organic material will combust, and the smoke will escape to the clay, forming small holes. When the water flows through this porous material, all the microbes, or most of them, will be filtered out and this allows uh, clean drinking water to be produced locally. An example pictured here shows that it's relatively simple to make. You just need a press and some molds so that you can have a consistent size, and it can be a local business. The important part when considering this from an engineering standpoint is that you want a reproducible engineered material. And in that light, we like to look at the scientific method to optimize these materials. So the inputs that we consider are what kind of material are you using? Does it matter? If you use sawdust or rice husk, is there a difference? What kind of clay are you using? How does that affect it? And the reason we use these materials is because they're ubiquitous around the world. So these can be made anywhere. And if we can uh, identify a way to make these the same for different materials, we can have a single method that's applicable anywhere. Also important when considering the outcomes, we look at the specifications by international organizations, such as Potters for Peace. And they recommend having a flow rate between one to three liters per hour and at least a two log removal. And I'll go into that a little bit in a moment. But what we look to do is to exceed these. If we can have a higher flow rate and a better removal rate, then we can provide better water for larger families with a single unit and provide that really anywhere. So I'm going to show you some graphs as an engineer, kind of like to present the data. And um, here's microbial removal. And what you'll notice is that on the y-axis, we have the log removal. And what that means is that a two log removal means you remove 99% of the microbials. And a five log removal is 99.999. So basically, each log is a nine. The porosity is a measure of the open space inside the filter. And that's directly related to how much sawdust or rice husk you put in that burns off. There's two main things I want to present here. First is that we have a really good removal rate. Pretty much all the samples that we've tested show that they meet that criteria or exceed it. And this means that we can treat dirtier waters, such as might be found in impacted disaster zones or areas where relief efforts needed, or just areas that have naturally dirty waters. Additionally, the other thing is that it shows a very strong trend with porosity. And so as porosity increases, the microbial removal decreases. And that's important because that means there's trade-offs. And as I mentioned with flow rate earlier, that is also related to porosity. So when you look at this graph, which is flow rate versus porosity, we can see that as porosity increases, flow rate increases. And that's important because that means that this trade-off, you can have a filter with very high flow rate, but with worse removal rates, or with lower flow rates, but higher removal rates. And finding that balance and optimizing the filter to provide the best middle ground is what we're looking to do. Additionally, what we can see here is that both sawdust and rice husk behave the same when compared to porosity, which means it's a really good measure for comparing different materials in different situations. This also accounts for differences in clay, as clay organic comp components can differ from like 5 to 15 percent. And so different clays, different materials can all be accounted for. The white line here is the standard model used for porous materials. And so this means, because it fits the data so well, we can take the um, 
data we've collected and compare it to all the background with flow through porous medium, and in that way design a filter that can provide better water uh, with higher flow rates pretty much anywhere around the world. And with that, I'd like to thank the individuals who worked on this project with me, and I guess we're taking one question. It looked like the sawdust had a better removal rating. Uh, could you comment on that? Um, that's simply that if you'll see that the, um, for the rice house, we haven't tested as wide a range of porosity for the removal at this time. So it's simply in that porosity, you can see that they have fairly similar except for that one data point. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me out of this microphone? Okay, so next I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Corden and Smith, who's gonna talk about ambitions for a civic architecture. And as I mentioned, Dr. Smith is one of the other co-leads of the Community for Global Health Equity and is serving as the Associate Director. Good afternoon, everybody. The work that I'm going to show, I'll show a series of images of uh, work that I did in Rwanda with students and colleagues uh, that, that I had as well as students and colleagues in Rwanda after I go through a couple of slides at the very beginning. As a student of architecture or an aspiring architect, one might be drawn to images like you see on the screen of the stadium for the Beijing Olympics known as the bird's nest at a cost of a half a billion dollars billion with a B. But the image masks consequences, both positive and negative, that 1.5 million residents were forcibly removed from their, from their homes in order to construct the stadium. And at the other hand, that Michael Phelps and his teammates would not have broken the records that they did without the specific design of this pool. The point is that design does not simply fulfill a functional need, but has the potential to be disenfranchising and empowering. Architecture, planning, and design influence the ways that we learn and how we socialize, human safety and human health and hum humans' fulfillment of their aspirations. What if we were to direct the kind of creativity that's required to produce something like this and to apply it to places with much greater need, such as the informal settlements where two billion of the world's population live? How might we start and how might we approach that work we might start by conducting research on local building traditions, in understanding natural and constructed landscapes, in understanding the ways that existing neighborhoods and social networks are organized, in sketching out the activities of daily life, in understanding patterns, in uncovering both hidden beauty and the hidden intelligence found in a local setting. The assembling of that knowledge into culturally specific, technologically appropriate, and economically feasible prototypes is what we're after. Seeking to make communities that are healthier and more efficient, yet still aspirational. It's a process that starts from understanding existing conditions, climate, ecology, society, and layers in the expertise that we bring to it from an understanding of best practices and things like recreation and food production, on civic participation, design of transportation, and how we provide commerce. The aim is to materialize and spatialize patterns of daily life into a neighborhood that improves, even if modestly, the health, well-being, and opportunities of its residents. Whether we are talking about distant cities 
or here in Buffalo, when the needs are high and the constraints are tight, a creative spirit is needed all the more, not the less. What I'm talking about is a process of integrative problem solving. If I need to design a stair and a retaining wall and a drainage ditch and a path, rather than solving those problems separately, how can I integrate the problem solving for a more efficient solution where the stair becomes better because of the retaining wall and the retaining wall becomes more exciting because of the stair? The ambition is not for a heroic architecture, like shown on the very first image, but for a civic architecture that is impactful and meaningful to the citizens who most need it, to the most vulnerable populations of the world, such as children and newborns. Thank you. Could I entertain a question from the audience? Perfect clarity, okay. thanks. There, sorry, there's one. Oh. <laughs> Microphone. She's, she, she's not allowed a question. Please do introduce yourself. I'm Jessica Skates. I am the administrative coordinator for the uh, Community for Global Health Equity, so I know Corey well. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a bit to maternal and child health and how what your presentation, what you mentioned in your presentation can be related to that. Sure, absolutely. So I, I would simply take a couple of specifics in this in that the materials that we build with have an impact on our health and the materials that we choose to build with in terms of our urban environments and cities and the way we design transportation systems, et cetera, as well as the way that we design and understand the materials of our own homes have an impact on human health. In addition, the, the ways that we might design and organize spaces of neighborhoods impact human behavior. Impacting human behavior then, of course, also has an impact on human health. Thanks, Corey. So next, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Shanta Murshid, who is uh, an assistant professor in social work and she's gonna be speaking about microfinance in Bangladesh. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to UB, John. Mm, the title of my presentation, Microfinance in Bangladesh, is intentionally hyperbolic to indicate that um, social policies and interventions are often nuanced and have nuanced ramifications. And so it's difficult to not talk about unintended consequences, which is what I'll be talking about today. So let me start with talking here, talking about microfinance a little bit, and then my study of microfinance thus far. So what is microfinance? Um, microfinance is an economic intervention that is targeted to poor women in Bangladesh with two goals of poverty reduction and uh, women's empowerment. It started in the mid-1970s by way of an experiment by Mohammed Yunus, who found that giving women small loans um, allowed them to help themselves out of poverty. And um, he used a group lending model. And the group lending model is a loan system that is based on group fidelity. About five to eight women belong to a group. And while made, uh, loans are made out to individuals, the groups are held responsible for repayment. And such that if one person fails to repay a loan at a timely manner, the whole group is held responsible for that and their credit history suffers. So my study of microfinance is based on two sources of data. I used the demographic health uh, surveys from USAID actually and the qualitative data that I collect um, and I've collected over the past couple of years, most recent being uh, this past summer where I interviewed microfinance participants and their husbands. Um, so in the quantitative portion of my study, I found that, well, many things, but I'll focus on four that I thought most interesting. One, microfinance participation is positively associated with intimate partner violence, IPV from here on, but only among poor women with wealth assets as opposed to poor women without wealth assets. Two, microfinance participants are more likely to be HIV literate compared to women who do not participate in microfinance. 
Three, there is a weak but positive association between microfinance and empowerment as me measured as a latent variable that uh, constitutes of um, autonomy, decision-making power in the household, and justification of intimate part of violence. And four, microfinance participants are no different from women who do not participate in microfinance in terms of help-seeking social networks, uh, even uh, particularly for things like IPV, even though they have increased social networks. In the qualitative study, I sought to understand the context of some of these linkages that I saw in the quantitative studies. Uh, some of the things that I found interesting, again, um, there were a couple. Um, one, women who report to have wealth assets are arguably from households that report higher wealth and higher income, which meant that women who did not need additional income um, were held accountable in terms of IPV. So there was a difference between women who needed um, microfinance to help themselves out of poverty and their households out of poverty, as opposed to women who wanted to do that. Um, and that really speaks to how men not only hold traditional gender roles for women, but also for men who are solely responsible for earning an income. Two, the increase in social networks and the strength of social networks in the form of um, lending group members and community members related to microbusiness did not create a space for, self, uh, for seeking help for IPV for particularly two reasons. One, there's this shame of um, IPV and, uh, that we know about. And two, it was considered unprofessional by these women. As somebody that I interviewed said, you know, they're my colleagues, they're not my friends. And so, no, I'm not going to seek help for IPV from them. Uh, three, many women reported sexual harassment on the streets, and that speaks perhaps to the larger issues of labor market participation by women um, in uh, developing nations where women are, um, it's more complicated. Them coming out into the labor market is a more complicated um, situation. And so, and and the f interesting part was though that many women found that astounding. Um, particularly women who were in uh, violent relationships were astounded that they were uh, probably equally likely to experience harassment on the streets by other men as well. And that also fed into their. Uh, reasons for not leaving violent relationships because they assumed that violence would maintain over relationships even if they uh, left their current abusive relationships. Four, uh, women took personal responsibility for a variety of issues, uh, poverty, the violence in their lives, uh, child care, health care, elder care, whatever have you. And it really reminded me of the work of social uh, social welfare agencies here in the US. Um, but instead of caseworkers and frontline workers, we have these women who are uh, really responsible for providing all these services for their families. And, and so it's them who are really trying to balance what we can perhaps call neoliberal, neopatriarchy in their work and personal lives. And six, or maybe that's five. Um, microfinance participation means little unless women have control over their resources. And two reasons for which women have um, limited control over their resources are, one, um, many women um, are errand runners, as Lamia Karim calls them, and they uh, shop from microfinance organizations to organizations looking for loans to give to their husbands. And two, they're really limited by their financial literacy, which um, makes them unable to run a business in the way that is intended. So in conclusion, I have a few, that's the parliament building of Bangladesh. And uh, I have a few policy recommendations very quickly. One, microfinancial services need to be bundled with relevant interventions. We see this in resource-rich countries like South Africa. This needs to happen in Bangladesh as well. Two, microfinance participants need to be made financially literate through literacy programs. Three, men need to be included as part of microfinance and as well as the larger campaign to empower women. They're involved anyway. It, it's time to bring them into the fold. Four, NGOs and microfinance organizations need to be held accountable for the goals that they set and how they go about achieving them. And lastly, we cannot be okay with the bare minimum. We need to think about poverty and health outcomes in the long run. Um, I've met microfinance participants who've been um, participating in microfinance for over 10 years, but they live in slums and they're, um, they're still under the poverty line. So that has to change. Thank you. And thank you.
And the most important thing is to ask questions, so if you have any. Thank you. I see one question in the back. Um, is there a reason why you chose Bangladesh and not, say, another place in the world to study this? Was well, Bangladesh is really the birthplace in the recent um, you know, um, years. Uh, it started in the 70s. It's also the oldest. So we have more evidence from Bangladesh than really anywhere else. OK, thank you. Thank you, Shanta. And I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Robert from the Graduate School of Education. She's an assistant professor of learning and instruction. And Dr. Robert will be talking about reimagine people, problems, policy. Thank you. Uh, okay. There we go. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Dr. Ram, and Dean Lee of the Graduate School of Education, uh, Provost Sukowski, and President Tripathi for the opportunity to insert teachers and schools into this critical conversation. Schools are key institutions for wh from which health and health education initiatives are launched. This is because of the symbiotic relationship of health and education. Each needs the other to thrive. With my brief time, I ask that you reimagine that symbiotic relationship from the perspective of teachers in public schools, which are oftentimes overlooked or a silent partner in maternal and child health interventions. I'll provide examples and questions from studies I've been conducting over the last decade that emanate from teachers' perspectives specifically and come from Metropolitan Buenos Aires, Argentina. So again, let's reimagine people problems, and policy, so as to forge global equity. First, reimagine people. Who is involved in interventions? How? What resources do they bring to efforts to address inequity? In a study in which I examined how neoliberal reform transformed teachers' work, teachers often began conversations with this quote, I don't know policy. But, and afterwards, I had to read many pages of transcripts in which they described with astute detail the movement of global to local ideas about education and health equity. They also described the decision-making process behind how they engaged with those ideas and those policies and transformed them in the everyday work of educating a population. But teachers did not consider themselves to be policy savvy, to be a part of the policy process, nor did they envision themselves as a, possessing a policy knowledge domain. This was despite going after resources to address students' social health and well-being, and that needs to change for teachers, and I can work on that by facilitating learning of policy and teacher education, but I hope to also encourage public policymakers to do the same. Because teachers were knowledgeable of policies related to education and health, teachers did not distinguish the two because they noted that if children were hungry, for example, they would not learn. Therefore, teachers did food programming despite their need to teach more, and this is particularly acute in a global context of accountability and the need to learn more and learn particular knowledge. And teachers did so despite a lack of acknowledgement of that work. Interventions must ask, who do we need to get involved in our projects? What will we ask of them? What knowledge do they possess that we do not? And this segues to the next item, reimagining problems. Now, policy is a problem-solving endeavor. So think of it, think of it as um, uh, problem-solving 101, really. Here are the questions I wish to bring to the fore are, who is defining the problems that interventions are targeting, and for whom? In another study I conducted with an Argentine pediatrician who specialized in eating disorders, so she was tasked and given a, a crew of public health officials, and their task was to reinvent the uh, century-old Argentinian national school food policy. And I just happened to come upon this study and what she was doing. Um, so we set about to uh, ask and to compare teachers and the public health officials' definitions of what the problem is that this national school food policy should be solving. And 
what we found were that they had completely different definitions of what the school food policy should be targeting. Um, the teachers identified a lack of access to food in their schools, whereas the public health officers identified obesity, the global epidemic of obesity, and then a lack of access to nutritious food as being the problem that the program should solve. Now, both are perhaps correct. The aim here is to emphasize the need to create policy from more voices, also, intervention should have built-in mechanisms for redefining the problem and for basically rebooting in the field if that definition needs to be tweaked. And teachers can help with that. However, we need to reimagine policy. Actually, we need to reimagine policy is just a lot of work. Um, so policy should, and also policy should not be personified because people do policy. And they do it sometimes unknowingly. So teachers, for example, make policy decisions daily and do policy work daily. This past week, I received an email from an alumni of our program who's working in the Buffalo Public Schools, so I'm going to bring it close to home. And she explained to, to me her teaching load in very um, intense paragraphs, um, the type of work um, getting students to learn and to engage with learning that she was doing. Um, however, um, the last sentence of this long email included the following. It said, I also have to spend time each day keeping up with the social work I must do to keep my students learning. So it seems that teachers, even close to home, are experiencing the symbiotic relationship of a need for health equity and a need for educational equity. Um, and it's a lot of work on top of the primary task of teachers, which is to educate youth. So to conclude, my hope is that schools' vital role in efforts to address maternal and child health concerns is acknowledged. I see so much possibility for connecting the dots differently to cultivate a dynamic symbiotic relationship between global health and global education equity efforts. Thanks. Thank so much. Yeah. I have a question. <laughs> um, so in my line of work, which has to do with hygiene, uh, school children are often thought of as agents of change, that what their parents don't do at home, those kids can learn at school and then take it back home. Mm -hmm. But it places the onus on teachers then to add yet another piece of workload yeah. mm -hmm. to their already sort of mm -hmm. very full, overly full days. Mm -hmm. And as you talked about, teachers needing to not only be caring about the educational effects of their work, they're needing to think about food and hunger mm -hmm. and you know, all of these pieces. And just, learning content. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. so I, mm -hmm. I think I'm asking you to comment on the extent to which we're maybe asking too much of teachers and sort mm -hmm. of where other systems should be coming into place to support what otherwise should be an education or a learning focused environment. Um, so I, I'm gonna, pull from the past. So um, Paulo Freire, a Brazilian, uh, well-known Brazilian educational theorist, theorist and activist, um, became the educational secretary for Brazil. Um, and the first thing he had to confront was a teacher strike. And um, what he did was he sat down with the teachers and he said, what do you want? Um, tell me, tell me what we need. And um, in the process of turning that question um, on them, on the teachers, and also acknowledging that teachers weren't uh, protesting just for their own needs, um, he got a long list of mostly the social and health. Uh, shortcomings of the public education system. So I think it's a matter of acknowledging teachers are willing and already doing a lot of that um, public health work. And I, I think that you'll still get a buy-in from them to continue to uh, work with public health officials. Um, it is more work and teachers work a lot but I think that they're willing to do that for the well-being of the student. I think teachers understand that they're there to educate the whole child. Yeah, sorry, I was looking at her. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks. And then lastly, um, so pleased to introduce Bazan Lin, who goes by Lin, um, to talk about the work of the Buffalo's Burmese Community Support Center. One of the key areas of interest for the Community for Global Health Equity is refugee health right here at home, here in Western New York. And um, 
Lynn is an exemplar, as well as an alumnus. <laughs> Well, thank you, Pavani, and um, the whole UP community for welcoming me and, and giving me this chance to talk to you. Uh, first of all, I, wish to, uh, I would like to wish you all um, in Burmese, Ming um, That means aus auspiciousness to you all. Um, I'm Burmese, of course, born and raised in Burma. Um, before I start my story, of, I don't have presentation. I, uh, you know, as an ethnographer, I like to tell stories. So uh, I have a story, but before I tell a story, I would like to ask some questions, right? So that's for all of you, each and every one of you. Um, how many of you know where Burma is? Oh, that's great. That's awesome. <laughs> how many of you know that we have at least 8,000 Burmese in Western New York? Very impressive. Very impressive. Thanks. That's great. All right, then I can tell my story. <laughs> um, Today, I would like to tell a story of Burmese Community Support Center, an ethnic-led organization that I help coordinate. Um, so the, the Burmese Community Support Center uh, grew out of need and necessity. Um, around 2010, Western New York has seen the influx of Burmese refugees. Um, we swelled quite quickly, and, and we even reached like, you know, around 7,000 um, in 2010. And, and uh, the general consensus today is about 8,000 to 10,000 in, in Western New York, so, which is quite big, right? So, but most of these refugees came to the United States with very limited access to English, and, and, uh, and also they carry very little capital, so, like you know, educational capital, social capital, and economic capital. So, so they came here with almost nothing, and that included me too. You know, I came to this country with $400, so um, it's, it's, it's quite true to almost all of us, right? Um, so, you know, in 2011, some of the leaders in Burmese community decided that we need a center to support our own folks. There are, of course, refugee resettlement agencies and post resettlement agencies in Western New York, but they can only do so much. Refugee resettlement agencies can only provide um, zero to six months service to refugees. After that, that's it. Like, you know, within a six month, how, how are they going to learn English or know how to live a life? in the United States, right? So that's where we came in. We conducted a community-wide need assessment within a Burmese community, and we found out that most of our folks need post-resettlement case management. So we decided that we're gonna do a post-resettlement case management for our own folks, and uh, we launched Burmese Community Support Center. And as a follow-up, we also conducted a second need assessment and asked our folks, like, what do you want most? What do you need most? And there are a couple issues that came up. And one of the major issues that came up in 2011 was that the health, the health concerns. Many of our community members are so worried because they, they have no idea how to navigate a healthcare system in the United States. We come from a culture where preventive medicine is non-existent. I have never learned how to floss, seriously. And I came from a very educated family. I never learned how to floss, yeah. So I never learned that I should check in with my physician um, quite often. No. I went and see my physician or a doctor when I got sick. And that's actually true up to the point. I'm actually very sick today. Um, so I went to Michael Hall yesterday because I realized that I got to go, go see a doctor. So that's how it is. So these are the difficulties that we have. Um, and, and, and so, you know, as a Burmese Community Support Center, our leaders, as, as you know, brainstorm and look for uh, different venues. How are we gonna make it? Because none of us have medical doctors in our community, because it's a it's pretty young community, right? And we still have no idea what's going on in the United States and how to navigate a healthcare system and, and, and even how to look for a proper healthcare. So that's difficult for us, right? And so we decided that, well, we're gonna reach out to a couple different folks, you know? And uh, perhaps, you know, they might respond and they might reach back out to us. Um, and so we started talking to, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, centers like Hope, you know, uh, uh, um, a medical center, and, um, and a, a couple of other practitioners that reside within the west side of Buffalo. Well, and by the way, most Burmese refugees live in, in either west side or in a river side, and, and some significant amount of Burmese refugees are now living in east side, but, but mo mostly uh, west side and, and river side, right? Um, and so we, we reached out to them, and we started to discuss about them. And they said, well... There is no silver bullet. It's going to take a while. But you have to keep walking. And that's what we did. And that's how we reached out to UB. And that's how we got to know with Pavani and all awesome people at UB. Right? And they actually reached out to us too. And I'm very glad that UB community is now doing that. 
Back in the day, we didn't see UB in our community. No. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a proud UB alumnus, but I didn't see UB again in 2006 or 7 in our community. Now we're seeing UB in our community, and I'm very proud and I'm very glad. At the end of the day, it is important that we, the Burmese community, and you, the scholars, the advocates, the practitioners and experts walk together so that we as a community can grow and become um, you know, active participant in the community and also a good contributors, a, a, uh, essential contributors, effective contributors in this community. So please walk with us, not just walk for us. Walk with us, walk with the Burmese community and we will walk with you so that we can achieve a better community, better Western New York community, better Buffalo community, better American community here in Western New York. Thank you so very much. Yeah. Oh, yeah, question. Yeah. Yeah. A question? Yeah. Thank you, yes, Lynn. Please. I yeah. see one question here. We're getting you the microphone. Hi, my name's Dori Marshall. I'm a psychiatrist um, with the university, and I work at ECMC. And my question to you um, certainly has local relevance with the Burmese community and other immigrant uh, peoples, but I think it has a, an international um, component too, and that is I've seen a number of Burmese patients and, and other immigrant patients as well who don't have words for depression or schizophrenia. They don't have a way to describe mental illness, and they mm -hmm. might just deny outright that there's ever been mental illness in their family. So. Uh, yes, exactly. So that's another big issue in our community, mental health. It's, 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 it's huge. The reason why it is huge is because we have this, this taboo, this, this uh, 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 social stigma rela uh, uh, attached to mental illness or mental health, right? So um, it, it's hard. And there, it's such a hard nut to crack. We still have no idea. We're still trying our best to tell our folks that it's okay. It's okay if you have a mental health issue. To be honest, my mom has mental health problems a lot because she is fighting. She has been struggling with, with um, depression for quite a while. And she, and e including my dad and, and, and most of my family, is still trying to refuse that, that she has it. So it's, it's huge because they don't want to be associated with that social stigma. Like, you know, they don't want to be called a crazy person. So I, I think, you know, as a practitioner and, and, and uh, as an you know, uh, uh, expert, I think it is important to let them know that it's common. Like, it's not just, you know, the Burmese. It's not just, like, white, black, yellow. You know, it's, it's with everyone. There is that mental health issues with, with every one of us um, living in, 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 um, in, in a human life. Um, so if we could relay a message that it's okay, come out, let us know that you have those issues so that we can solve. And we're not gonna see you as a crazy person or we're not gonna um, you know, put that term like you know, uh, yeah, you're a mentally ill person. Um, th th I think that, you know, that's gonna change a lot. Um, but again, as I said, there is no silver bullet. We're still trying to figure things out. I'm, I'm even still struggling to convince my family, so it's, it's tough, so yeah. Thank you, thanks. and thanks for all the questions. Um, I'd like to invite Dr. Barrazzo to uh, share some reflections, and then we can go to some discussion. So um, thanks so much, Pavani, and thanks so much to all of you for the warm welcome here. Um, I want to thank also the Office of President Tripathi for all the work they did in, organi in organizing the visit. And I have to say, it's really impressive to see what the premise is of what you're trying to do here, and I think that this opportunity, I think the idea of the critical conversation and the idea of trying to foster uh, dialogue, dialogue both internally to the university across disciplines as well as between the university and the community is really impressive. Um, it doesn't happen often enough. It's very challenging because, we, because all uh, my experience with interdisciplinary work is that each of the disciplines has their own way of communicating. But fortunately, there seems to be some opportunity. And I also look in the back of the room and put this, see the student's first motto in the back. And this is, reminds us that this is a place where you actually have the opportunity to influence generations to come. So if you, if you don't end up at the University of Buffalo, but even if you do and you want to leave, come work for USAID and hopefully I'm a good advertisement for that. So I also want to thank uh, the Provost Chip, Chip Zukoski for his gracious introduction. 
Uh, it's a little bit humbling when you're, by reference, when you hear references to prominent scholars, uh, potentially, and hopefully some of what I can offer will rise to the level of useful insights. Um, but I do hope that my 22 years of working at USAID and international development can offer something about the way these kinds of interdisciplinary conversations can be most effectively brought to some fruit, because that's what we're really striving for. Which we're not just trying to talk, we're trying to talk in a way that's gonna be constructive and bear, has, and bear some fruit and, bear, and have some action, which is um, and actions that um, will have the greatest impact on what we're really all trying to do co collectively, which is improve the lives of people, both here in the U.S. as well as around the world. It was really interesting to uh, hear some of these presentations. I think they're, they're actually it's quite a diverse collection of different, per different perspectives. Um, Pavani, I really like the language of the leveraging underutilized domains. I think that's really what, what this is all about, as opposed to having one-dimensional conversations, remembering about all these multiple dimensions. And I think that's something which is the core and the challenge of interdisciplinary work. Um, it's absolutely critical to have that conversation and to figure out that approach if we're gonna really successfully address the challenges, I've already said, and Pavani, you were very articulate about that. Uh, of the, the presentation by Luke of the ceramic water filter, I think it's, you know, it's fantastic to see the way there's innovations, ongoing innovations in technology. I think that um, we sometimes believe that, well, we've solved most of the problems, we don't need anything new. Well, we actually always can use new ideas. I think innovation is the basis of what makes so much of the world work. And I think that the thing that, the key thing that was highlighted for me is that when we have something like a key technology, this is where it's, it's absolutely critical that we bring in other disciplines because the interface of technology and behavior to achieve an outcome is absolutely critical. When I was first starting at USAID, I, if you want to hear more about my circuitous career path from engineer to maternal and child health, you know, come to the keynote address tomorrow. When I was first starting at USAID, uh, I once went to a meeting, a lunchtime meeting of something called AIDIS, which was the association in the Latin American region of environmental engineers. And they did this great presentation about this new thing that they've developed. I don't even remember what the thing was at this point. But the line that stuck with me was that we have, now we've got this great technology, we only have to convince people to use it. And that's the, the starting point of the conversation should actually be bring in the user at the outset. And I think that the kinds of technologies and that interface of technology behavior is so critical around things like these household technologies. Also on the water problem, it also highlighted for me one of the challenges we always have in translating any kind of es an estimate of anything into some kind of useful statement about need. So the statement that there are 660 million people without safe water, it's actually probably many more people than that that don't have safe water. I mean, we've, as Pavani said, we've collaborated for a long time. We have once, we've once collaborated, I think, on a study in Haiti and water quality in Haiti and showing that people who even purportedly had access to what was deemed to be safe water, when you actually looked at it, it wasn't very safe. And those of you who have traveled in the developing world, if you, the, the water that's coming out of a tap in terms of that 660 million number, that's water that's considered safe. And I bet most of you will not drink water out of the tap in most of the places that you travel. And it's probably a wise decision. <laughs> that's right. Um, so, the, so what's the challenge in that, on that particular point? Well, the challenge is that that word safe came from something called the Millennium Development Goals. And the Millennium Development Goals are they're ending at the end of this year, but they're being replaced by sustainable development goals and then have some common elements. But the idea was that we wanted people to have safe water. So what is safe? Well, they didn't have a way of actually going out and measuring the safety of water, but they did have a way of using surrogates. So the surrogate became what kind of water source were you using? So the 660 million actually refers to people who don't have access to what's, in called, an improved, what's called an improved water source. And Frankly, whether that's, it's not really, a, it's not really safe, unsafe, clean, unclean, but rather there's a spectrum of risk. 
So this brings me to the last point, because I found, I found Luke's uh, presentation quite stimulating in terms of thinking about these things, is that, in fact, when you think about a spectrum of risk, that the household that may be most at risk for poor water quality also is the same household that's probably using a three-stone fire for cooking. It's probably also a household that doesn't have access to any kind of sanitation facilities. And so we have to, when I think, when we think about this household technology problem, try to look at the full package of either technologies or behaviors and everything that goes into helping that household become a safer and healthier place for people to live and try to, try to approach the problem from that perspective. Um, I want to mention to Corey a couple of things. One is that m when I was a grad student, my first re research project was funded by the architecture department. It was, a, it was actually looking at the impact of energy efficient design in, low, in residential housing, um, in low income neighborhoods, in urban centers in the United States on indoor air quality. So you bet it's a, it's a simple, the simple the simple, the simple problem was as you make the building envelope tighter, you have less fresh air, and things that are in the indoor environment can tend to build up. So I was studying stoves and things like this. And my second research project as a grad student was actually funded by a school of public health in which I was looking at toxic substances in the indoor environment and some of those related to building materials. So both his, uh, both, a couple of the points that he made both in, the, both in his presentation and in the question resonated with me. Um, but I want to just emphasize that I really like the statement you made and the emphasis you put on that context matters. And I think that this integrated thinking is really what's going to be required to fully address the you know, context in all of its forms, from physical context, cultural context, financial context, and so on. So I, I continue to try to promote and, and promote that kind of integrated thinking. Nadine, I want to say thanks for uh, using the DHS so effectively. The DHS has been something, demographic and health surveys have been supported by AID for 30 years now. And you know, combined with other sources of similar, similar survey data, like the uh, mixed surveys that are supported by UNICEF, we have a frankly rather large database that is really useful for looking at exploring associations and generating hypotheses. And I think that's the kind of work that you've been doing, and I think we want to, I think it's, I think it's a, a still underexploited resource. There's a lot more that we could do with this. There's challenges every year, every, not every year, every five years, the DHS comes up for review, and there are challenges in terms of what people want to keep asking more and more things. The surveys cannot get longer and longer, but you don't want to delete the old questions because you want to be able to compare changes, compare things and changes over time. So it's, um, it's just a challenging problem. But I do think that uh, if you're not familiar with the DHS, the work that they've done, not only in terms of the individual surveys, but also they have analytic reports and comparative studies. There's a number of different things that they've already done. But certainly, you can come up with your own questions and get full access to those data sources and really try to figure out you know, what are some new things that people haven't really even thought about, but that we actually think you know, potentially there's something there that should be worth, is, merits further exploration. Um, Sarah, I appreciated that your presentation reminded us that teaching is not a one-dimensional thing and that we need both health and social system support for teaching to work effectively. Um, and that, and I think they are Pavani's question about it, but that in general, globally, this connection between education and health, that linkage in both directions is critically important and certainly something I want to pick up on in terms of talking about intergenerational child and maternal mortality. Uh, we know that uh, less educated girls become less, are less educated women and that they are, the, the mortality risks for both them and for their children are much higher. So this, that intergenerational, that intergener, inter, intergenerational links between health and education, I think, are something we continue to, support, uh, continue to uh, explore. Lynn, I want to just, uh, I just want to emphasize that I really felt that I you know, really drove home the point that knowledge is not behavior. I know how to floss, and I don't do it often enough. And um, 
I also want to just say that it highlighted again the thing I started out with, is that you've really got this opportunity in these critical conversations, which is great, to actually forge that link between the university, I think it was somebody that was, it was beyond the ivory tower, getting beyond the ivory tower and forging those links to the community. So I'm looking forward to our continued discussions in small groups. Uh, I hope to see some of you at the, uh, at the presentation I have to make tomorrow afternoon. And again, thanks for your warm welcome. And I look forward to, to our conversation now and over the next day, day and a half. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thank you. So the floor is open for comments, for questions, provocative statements. Please do introduce yourself, if you would. Yes, I'm Bob Jentko. I'm a professor of microbiology and dentistry in the dental school, and uh, done a lot of work with uh, dental disease and, and uh, chronic uh, non-communicable diseases, showing the relationship. And I have a motto that says, uh, eat no fat, walk your dog, and floss your teeth. <laughs> My question is, uh, uh, the Millennium Development Goals seem to work reasonably well from what I can understand. and They're being reviewed and analyzed now. And uh, do you have some comments as to maybe why they work so well, if you think they did, and also the replacement, I forget the acronym, but it, it seems to be less uh, defined and more diverse and dispersed. And I just wonder if you think it's going to work as well. So I bet that question was for me. So I'll, uh, I'll start. <laughs> So I, I, I now regret making any reference to flossing. But the, <laughs> you know, the MDGs were a little bit curious in one sense because the Millennium Development Goals were adopted in the year 2000, but the baseline was set to 1990. So when they were adopted, they already knew how far they had come in the first 10 years of the 25-year period from the Millennium Development Goals. My perception is that they've worked well in some spheres. They've worked well for the health goals, MDGs 4, 5, and 6. They've worked pretty well for the water side of the, uh, the water target that was part of the environmental goal, which was MDG 7. The way that they worked well, though, was that government started paying attention, my read on this, about the year 2007, 2008, when, it started to say, when they started to look at, oh, we've got some systematic reporting that's coming out saying how close are countries to achieving the MDGs. And that's when that started. There was a couple of, there were a couple of different ways in which that was done. One was the uh, joint monitoring program of UNICEF and WHO on the water side. And then there was the countdown to 2015 reports that came out. Uh, it was a, a, an academic group, but also loosely associated with uh, the partnership for maternal, newborn, and child health. And so as as countries started to focus their efforts, you started to see more deliberate um, acceleration of the coverage of key interventions that we would relate, relate to those outcomes. And you can see the overall impact. If you compare the acceleration, I mean, compare the rate of reduction in mortality from 1990 to 2005 versus 2005 to the present, you can see in many countries that there was a very marked acceleration. Now, part of that in some countries was due to the fact that there were some issues that got a lot of money. So one of the things that kicked in around 2005 was a very focused effort around malaria. Malaria money mattered. And you know, malaria contributes you know, seemingly on the range of 20 to 55 percent on mortality reduction in, endemic, in countries in Africa where malaria is endemic. Um, so that was, one, that was one key factor. Then there's, the, and so yes, in one sense, they have been very successful. And they, they achieve what they set out to achieve. One of the things that was a shortcoming, in my view, of the way the child health and maternal health targets were framed was that they were all relative targets. So you, you, were, you achieved success if you had a two-thirds reduction from where you were back in 1990. That was for child, and it was three-quarters on the maternal mortality side. One of the things that we tried to do when we started thinking about the next generation of targets, and we pushed really hard for this, was instead of having a relative target to have an absolute target, that every country would be below a certain mortality level, that that was the maximum for every country in the world. And so for a country that in 1990, that's an example, had an under five mortality rate of 250, and they succeeded 
in getting down to, let's say, 240 to make the math easier, math easier. 240, and they succeeded in getting down to 80, well, then they met MDG4. They had a two-thirds reduction. But an under-5 mortality rate of 80 per 1,000 is still very high. So the idea for the MDG target, and we pushed this agenda back uh, starting in 2012, we started, to, we started with a 2035 target, getting every country to 20 per 1,000 or below by 2035. It ended up being adapted for 2030 to be 25 per 1,000, every country below 25 per 1,000. So when you ask the, the last, just to respond to your, the, your second question, the SDGs, yes, have this, this broader agenda. There are 17 goals. There's 169 targets under those, under those goals. Some of the goals are very broad. I think I've just, I just recently focused on, tar I think, goals 15 and 16. One is, 15 is protect life on land, and the other, uh, protect life underwater, and the other is protect life on land. These are very broad. So what matters is the targets. And so I think that on the health side, we've actually been fairly successful in getting some specific targets incorporated into the SDGs. And that wasn't, you know, if you had asked me that whether we were going to be successful back in June, I would have said it was iffy, but we finally were able to get a very specific child health target and a specific maternal mortality target built into the health SDGs. Now, I'm looking at this, this from, a, from a maternal and child health lens, and that's maybe not, that's not comprehensive. So, okay. Thank you. I'm uh, Michael Noe, uh, a uh, clinical professor in the School of Public Health and Health Professions. A uh, question for uh, Sarah Robert. Uh, your comments about the difficulties that uh, teachers face, uh, not dealing only with the challenges of education, but all of the uh, more social and cultural problems uh, in the classroom that interfere in the process. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if there is an opportunity here for interprofessional education and practice, uh, integrating what is done in education with social work. And I, I ask that because interprofessional education uh, has become an essential requirement uh, in the health sciences. Uh, and it seems, although my understanding of this may be very superficial, that uh, there may be a, an opportunity here uh, for uh, some interdisciplinary and interprofessional experiences that would uh, help to address those problems. So thank you. And actually, in a, in a current project I'm doing, there are teachers who have actually sought, um, I, I guess, what would be described as this interprofessional um, uh, education and specifically around uh, policy making and public policy making because they've realized as they've um, progressed in the career that they now feel comfortable in their classroom work and they want to expand on um, they want to be able to take that knowledge into the policy sphere. So um, I, I think teachers are willing and open to that. What is not open to perhaps the interprofessional uh, education is the um, initial stage of entering the classroom, and that has to do with uh, ever stricter guidelines around what teachers need to know before they can enter a classroom. And that I can speak to both in the case of the United States where I, I prepare teachers for the classroom and for certification in New York State, but also in Argentina where also you have a dramatic change that's taking place in teacher education and what needs to be done and accomplished and known and proved before they enter the classroom. So uh, the positive is perhaps that's providing a more rigorous uh, preparation for teachers in our classrooms, but um, the negative side is that when you find these little uh, uh, not little, but gaps in knowledge, which may actually enhance a teacher's ability to do their work. There's not much space in their professional education to do so, at least at the initial stage. Um, however, later on, yes, and now I'm gonna look up interprofessional um, education as well. Thank you. Thank you. We have a, qu a question in the front and then in the third row.
Hello, my name is Jillian Farrell and I'm a senior at Sacred Heart. And I was wondering if there's anything we can do for any of your projects as a high school student to help out. I think the biggest thing you can do is to keep learning, becoming educated. I know on my Facebook feed, I don't know about yours, but I see all the time examples of you know, high school students getting involved, getting interested in global health issues, and um, finding opportunities. So fundraising is one, but I think another is to think about what you can do locally, right? So if you are interested, which I, I would offer to all of you, please do email that globalhealth at buffalo.edu address, and let us find out ways to get you engaged, um, perhaps in something here at home, uh, in all of the various global health activities that are relevant right here, but also becoming increasingly informed about global health issues, I think can really shape, shape your education as you move forward. So let us find opportunities for you to learn more as well. Hi, I'm Vid Vishayit. I'm a PhD student in epidemiology, and my question is um, to Dr. Murshid. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Some of the findings I find I also found to be very surprising. My question to you is: um, so you recommended involvement of men in the microfinancing process. Um, so this is from anecdotal experience, but I went to one um, kind of conference fun funding conference that. Um, focus on empowerment, and this is in a very um, kind of religious and conservative community. And one gentleman came up, he's a member of the community, and his comment, um, I wouldn't relay here, but it's kind of anti-Western, and very patriarchy to the max. So my question to you is, um, if we involve the men in this process, how can we ensure that like, you know, the microfans will be empowering to the women? and not, as you have found, to be like a way that like men can further um, put in their patriarchy and um, change, like, can actually change um, the situation of the women. Uh, thank you for your question. That's a good question. And um, th that's really the reason why I think men should be brought into the fold. Because yes, men exist, and men are partners of these women, and they have a, a role in their life. And so when these women are going out there accessing microfinance and the men are not, uh, particularly when they are unemployed or when they don't have sources of income of their own, it creates what you know, is known as status inconsistency which leads to dysfunctional behaviors such as IPV and so on. Mm, but you know, with that is the notion that a lot of the development agenda or women's empowerment uh, strategies involve women and women only. So while women have m moved forward in terms of their ideas of what it means to be a woman or what it means to work outside the home, uh, what empowerment means, men have not. Men haven't been targeted, men haven't been talked to about these things, and that's really what I mean by they need to be part of the uh, system. Uh, I think in terms of interventions, I think microfinance can be bundled with interventions that target both men and women uh, through which awareness programs can be spread. And this is a long, uh, you know, um, we can talk for hours about this, but I think, you know, um, bringing them into the fold would allow them to understand what's happening in the lives of women. I think they're in the, in the dark, they really are, and they don't know that, you know, um, things are different now or things have changed in, for women and women think that, you know, they can have work-life balance and that they can work outside the house. Men often don't and, men, and like I said before, you know, men don't just have traditional views of gender or gender roles for women, they have it for themselves too. And so, you know, I think discussions about masculinity and what it means for them to be men is also an important part of uh, where we go forward. Thank you, good question again. John, did you want to comment? I should I say... I'm um, curious about the men exist question. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in my own work, <laughs> we've done work on hand hygiene in the newborn period because it's such an incredibly vulnerable time. About, you know, 45% of all childhood deaths happen in the newborn period in low-income settings. And so we've done observations of newborns in the households, and we see incredibly few events 
contact between men in the family and the newborn compared to mothers, of course, but also other, other adult women and girls in the family. And so I think that there is really something to what you're saying about, you know, not only sort of the locus of responsibility, but also the, um, the perceived uh, influence in, on children and on the health and well-being of families. Um, so I appreciate the comment. Question in the back. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Bipla Bhattacharya. I'm a PhD student in the uh, Industrial and Systems Engineering Department. My question is to uh, Dr. Murshid about uh, her study, where uh, I noticed that uh, microfinance had a weak but positive relation, uh, relationship with empowerment. So what are your thoughts on why um, it was a weak positive correlation as such? Um, well, to be more specific, by weak uh, correlation, I mean um, the P value is um, less than 0.1, but not uh, 0.05. And uh, sorry, that's a very technical uh, response. But uh, why that may be, uh, well, part of it could be just the understanding of empowerment. I, um, in, this, in the data set, there are questions about uh, justification of IPV. There are questions about decision-making power in the household. And there are questions about autonomy and freedom of movement. So perhaps you know, there, um, that misses something uh, else that um, captures empowerment. And maybe. Um, there needs to be uh, there need, needs to be other things such as perhaps agency that doesn't is not captured in that definition. So maybe that's part of the reason. But I think the other reason is that mm, women's you know what does it even mean to be empowered? I think that's a basic question that we need to start with. Um, you know, having a sum of money doesn't empower women unless it um, relates to things like. Um, justification of IPV. If I uh, justify IPV but I have a lot of say in the household, does that mean I'm empowered? Um, I suggest that I am not. And so that's part of what is being picked up, I think, in that association. So, um, but also, if I spread it out and have done this, um, and if I look at decision-making power and autonomy and uh, justification of IPV separately, mm, the strongest correlation I find is with autonomy, which again makes sense because they, we, women are going out of, outside the house, they have more autonomy, they have freedom of movement, but not as much with decision-making power and um, and IPV. And again, reasons for that you know, could include, um, well, first of all, you know, uh, the decision-making process is a, is, a, um, is a process that we don't think about in terms of outcomes, you know, what are decisions uh, based off or, or what kind of decisions are being made, but who, and, but who informs those decisions? Just because I am making a decision doesn't mean that I am devoid of, say, my partner's um, influence on me. So, uh, and, and the other part is that decision-making power is, um, is often um, directed by gender roles as well. So men all often make um, important decisions or decisions about large purchases, for example, as opposed to uh, daily purchases. So all of those things come into play when we're talking about empowerment in my study. So um, it could be a variation and a mix of all of that. I'll send you my paper if you're really interested. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Grace Trumpeter, and I'm a first year medical student here at UB. Um, I guess my question is for Dr. Smith and uh, Mr. Scannell. So the title of this is called Beyond the Ivory Tower. So when I think of that, I think about, um, I guess different, we have different levels of the ivory tower perhaps represented here, maybe USAID. USAID being one of them and UB being another. And um, so going beyond the ivory tower, I think of getting the community involved, which was um, maybe addressed by uh, Mr. Lin. So in your research, which um, kind of looks at interventions um, directly at the, the individual or household level, how are you incorporating community members um, into your research? So I'll focus on, thank, thank you for the, for the question, and I'll focus particularly on the images that I showed with the, with the work in Rwanda in that case. And again, this was not a project that I particularly went and sought. It was something where there, I had colleagues uh, and, and a particular opportunity to get involved, and colleagues in Rwanda uh, came to myself and uh, my, the students that I was working with. And 
so in that case, we were working with the Kigali Institute of Science and Technology, which is, has an architecture program there, and faculty members, and a group of students. Those students were matched with all of the students that I brought from my previous institution, and myself, as well as practitioners and designers working with the, the mayor's office in Kigali, and uh, involved a great deal of what we might refer to as field research or anthropological work, where we were meeting with uh, uh, rural communities as well as urban communities. In this particular case, there's a lot of rural to urban migration that you see in lots of settings right now. But that rural to urban migration, it was important to understand what rural life was like. How do people cook? How do people do laundry? Really simple things and tasks of daily life. And how are those things then organized at the neighborhood scale? How are those things organized within the household? And how do they become spatial or material? Because that, that's what architecture is, is a spatial and material discipline. And based on that work and the things that we were learning, and we were doing some linguistic work to understand language and how things were described in terms of building technologies and spaces, you know, that there are five different names for five different types of courtyards. You know, that, that, those are things that I didn't know before going. And in that process, that research, again, with community members, eventually bubbles up. And we layer in, then, a disciplinary expertise that brings in engineering and material perspectives. And how can we transform existing technologies as a means to, because the goal there was to increase density, but do so in a way that uh, makes cultural sense. Because over 95% of the housing is single family housing, but that's unsustainable relative to land use and, and some other, other things. So it was a multifaceted partnership with government organizations, students, uh, and, and, and professionals as well. It turns out that's a fantastic way to end this program because it really brings together the communities whose um, lives we're seeking to affect um, with the scholarship and the um, professional expertise that I think we at the University of Buffalo can bring to bear on the major challenges of equity. So I really appreciate the question. Thank you so much. And thanks for all of the questions and the attention this afternoon. I really wanted to thank again our speakers and I'm gonna leave uh, the last word to Dr. Barrazzo. I just wanted to comment on a couple of comments. One is I've never heard USAID referred to as an ivory tower, but it's an interesting idea. <laughs> um, if only sometimes, that would be great. Second, I wanted to come back to the question about what can high school students do. I think that the policy level, there's increasing recognition of the importance of youth in, in getting behind a, what is, we're trying to create is a social movement to end preventable child and maternal deaths, at least in that sphere. I just, come, I just came from a meeting we had in Zambia with something called the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health, which for the last 10 years has been this constituency-based partnership of civil society organizations, academic research, academic institutions, countries, multilateral institutions, bilateral donors, and they decided, private sector, and now they've decided for the first time to create a youth constituency. And so I think that's recognizing, one, is that there's just, this, there's a bulge, there's a youth bulge in the world now. And the way to capture the imagination of youth is to give them their voice at the table. And I think that's actually going to be really important. Uh, I want to just mention one thing, something I forgot to mention earlier in response to the MDG question. Meeting the MDG target is a, it's not as clear cut as it sounds. Um, one is that there's actually, there's uncertainty in mortality estimates. So whether you've met it or not is actually a little bit probabilistic. The second is that meeting it in terms of a national target is one thing, but there are huge inequities within countries. And those, there are huge inequities in the United States. There are huge inequities within Washington, D.C. If you go from one side of the city, part where I live, where under five mortality is about three, and you go across to where there are larger concentrations of poverty in Washington, D.C., the under five mortality is about 15. So that's, you know, that, that, those inequities exist everywhere. And incidentally, the U.S. didn't, by any definition, okay, the U.S. did not meet the MDG's four target, MDG 4 target for child mortality reduction or the MDG 5 target for maternal mortality reduction. In fact, since 1990 in the U.S., maternal mortality has roughly doubled. So and there are a lot of different reasons for that. So we clearly have other work to do here in the United States as well if the, glo if the global conversation is not necessarily where your passion takes you. Thank you. Thank you again.
So I think if, if folks want to chat further, we can be available either in the room or just outside. And again, uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 2.30 on the North Campus in the Student Union Theater for Dr. Brazo's keynote speech. Thank you.